Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to see so many great names who've decided to join us uh, just rolling through the participant panel. This is going to be quite an event. Uh, my name is Peter Roberts. I'm Director of Military Sciences here at the Royal United Service Institute on Whitehall, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this paper launch uh, of a new research output called The Future of the NATO Core uh, with the report's authors. The paper's been underwritten by RUSI and the Association of the US Army, uh, which is our sort of uh, sister uh, cousin in the US, who have joined us in writing another publication this year. Last year, it was Jack's paper on MDO for Allies. There's a really strong relationship between RUSI and the AUSA, which RUSI is incredibly proud of uh, going back more than two decades. And it was a shame we couldn't welcome them in person to the Land Warfare Conference last year, but we're certainly looking forward to having them over at our Land Warfare Conference uh, later in this summer. Now, although this report was released at 10 o'clock this morning, I don't expect for a second that everyone has made the time to read and fully digest it. Um, I have. So I'm fortunate and probably uh, some, somewhat ahead, unusually, uh, uh, with most of the audience. But the paper really breaks down the problem into three sections, and each of those will be covered today. The first covers the wider context and how the core fits into sort of modern concepts of fighting. The second deals with the adaptations that's going to be required by the core in the future. And the third deals with the impact, the recommendations for NATO. It is an incredibly accessible and digestible uh, report. And, and I would, you know, I, I think the authors have done a, a really great job in exploiting their own personal strengths. Now, most of you who've joined will be familiar with uh, Dr. Jack Watling, Rusi's Land Warfare Research Fellow, whose reports and research have been in demand with Western militaries for the past few years. Uh, and again, his writing on not just uh, military affairs, but uh, contemporary conflict are, are really worth clutching into. Secondly, uh, the other author we're very privileged to have with us is uh, Lieutenant General retired Sean McFarlane, uh, who's retired from the uh, US military in 2018, but has huge experience at the core level. Uh, not just in command, but also at more junior levels. So, uh, and not just with, as he's sort of known, uh, with that command of three corps, but also with uh, other corps as he came up through uh, the staff throughout his long career in the US Army. His, uh, his, I suppose he's most known, uh, Sean, for his command of three corps in uh, Combined Joint Task Force uh, Op Inherent Resolve uh, and commanding the coalition against ISIS in Syria and Iraq. But listen, whilst he retired from the US military in 2018, there is so much more to his background. I am not going to go into the bios of each one because, frankly, you can see those on the website and you Google those. And we need to hear more from them and less from me talking about them. The structure of this event is a, sort of a dog and pony show, really, between the two authors. Uh, and they will cover some of the opening of it, starting with Jack and then flip flopping between Sean and Jack as we go ahead. And then we're going to hit the question and answer session. Uh, now, the Q&A is going to be facilitated by me, and I'll read your questions. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to populate and send me your questions, uh, and I will then pose those and amalgamate them together, and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, particularly, we'll try and get to the more topical and interesting ones uh, and, and push through that right until our hard stop time at 1600. In terms of attribution, this entire session is on the record until 1600. Uh, and that's probably as much as you need to know for right now. So enough from me. Let's get right over to the uh, authors and hear what they've got to say. So, Jack, you're first up. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you're joining us from the States. Um, so the core as an operational echelon uh, has been central to military operations for most of the last two centuries, from the Grand Armée of Napoleon right the way through to Operation Desert Storm. Um, and really is a, a linchpin of how the West has fought throughout the Second World War, the Korean War, um, and going back from there. And yet, over the last three decades, the core has really, I won't say dropped from prevalence, but its role has become slightly opaque and obscured. And I think the reason for that is that the scale at which we've operated has diminished. We've been engaged in very complex uh, operations that are geographically very dispersed without clear boundaries. Um, and the result has been that while we have maintained core headquarters, 
Uh, most of our focus in terms of how we operate in the UK has been at the company multiple uh, or battle group level. And in the US has largely been at the brigade combat team level with divisions almost fulfilling a operational function of rotating those brigade combat teams into and out of theater. And so the role of the Corps has been, as I say, slightly uh, uncertain. And yet I think as we look forward and we're going into a new era of great power competition, the core is actually becoming once again a critical echelon in military operations. And so I'm gonna briefly outline the changes in the operating environment, which push the emphasis back towards the core and then hand over to Sean, who's gonna talk about what the core might actually need to do in that environment. So the thing I want to begin with is that recognized throughout the US military, UK uh, and NATO militaries is the increasing lethality that is brought to bear in the close fight of the modern battlefield. And this is a mixture of the increased density and fidelity of tactical sensors, uh, the increased uh, volume of precision munitions that are available, and the increased range of fires, which means that a brigade that is now in contact with an adversary formation is likely under fire from multiple enemy brigades simultaneously, and that could be precise fire. The result being that those tactical formations can be very, very quickly attrited down to a point where they are not combat effective and engaged in depth. In fact, one of the big questions is how do you get into contact against multiple layers of standoff? And that's one of the things that multi domain operations is geared towards trying to address. Um, and so in this context, we know that there is a heightened tempo and lethality at that tactical edge. The problem is that rather than making us more willing to commit our forces to decisive engagements, that is pulling us away from wanting to do that because we, don't, we can't afford to lose our forces. We don't have the mass, especially outside of the US, to suffer significant losses. And actually that applies for Russia as well. While Russia has a very large armed forces, they also have a lot of border to cover they have numerous security problems and their equipment is not distributed evenly across those forces. So this isn't just a problem that we're facing. The, the reality is, is that the commitment of those tactical echelons in the close fight has to be done under the most favorable of circumstances. And so you need somebody to set up those favorable circumstances. And so I think what we see is that in the contemporary security environment, you have higher echelons who are shaping that environment, engaging in a proactive state of competition before conflict to set up favorable opportunities to commit their forces. And once hostilities are commencing, then actually a prolonged shaping battle before you actually commit those tactical echelons to the fight. And you might ask, well, why isn't that the division's responsibility? Um, but my answer would be that the problem we have there is that the division sits today almost at the, the center point of where a lot of that long range precision fires and high fidelity sensing uh, will engage. And so if you try and put a large volume of uh, troops and personnel that are supposed to be providing a shaping function in that divisional echelon, then they are sitting under the most intense indirect fire threat. Uh, across the entire battlefield um, and will be very quickly attrited. Now, there is an argument that says, well, we, that's simple. We just pull the uh, division further from the front line of our own troops, forward line of our own troops, we pull it back and it can still perform that function. But the reality is the division still plays a critical role in managing, resupplying and coordinating those brigades that are under its command. And if you start pulling it further back, then all of your logistics elements that are sustaining that close fight suddenly have to traverse a unpopulated gap between the division and the brigades, which is a very dangerous place to be. We've seen in the Gorno-Karabakh just last year what happens when attrition is enabled in resupply of the front. It collapses and it can't sustain the fight, irrespective of the morale um, or indeed the mass that might be available at that front edge. And so the division has a very important job to do, but it is unlikely because it is going to need to be lean to avoid being hit by those fires. And it is going to need to be um, engaged in a very complex fight to sustain its brigades to be performing that shaping function. And so I think what we're very likely to see is pulling back a lot of those responsibilities onto the core. And in NATO, um, 
we might envisage the core as the highest tactical and lowest operational echelon, the echelon that takes clear objectives from SACUR um, and from LANCOM and has a responsibility for pursuing those objectives and assigning uh, those lines of effort. But increasingly, it's not just a command function, which it has been in the past. Instead, because of the range of fires and that need to shape the environment before those capabilities are committed, the core is increasingly becoming a fighting echelon that is engaged in its own very, very intense fight. And if it loses that fight, then it becomes exponentially difficult for the divisions and brigades under its command to get into the close fight and do what they need to do. Um, in other words, layered standoff becomes uh, very, very difficult to penetrate. And so the core is both becoming a center of mass in operations in the future, um, but it is also, I think, moving from its old function of command and into one that is much more proactively engaged in kinetic exchanges. In order to perform that function, it's going to need a range of new capabilities. And so I would now hand over to Sean, uh, who will detail what some of those capabilities might be and some of the old and new challenges that the core will face. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Jack. So uh, hello, everybody. It's uh, very early in the morning here in uh, San Diego. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll say good morning to all of you, irrespective of your time zone. Um, so a couple of things I'd like to talk about first is, uh, you know, what does the core do in multi-domain operations or what would it do? And then secondly, um, how it would be organized for combat. So, uh, you know, the, one of the things that we always like to do when we're fighting uh, uh, the bad guys is to force them to fight into, in multiple directions at the same time, confuse them and then create uh, mass against the, an enemy uh, vulnerability and pile on. So what multi-domain operations enables or envisions is the uh, doing the same sort of thing, except in, instead of multiple directions, we're gonna do it in multiple domains and create a vulnerability in a specific domain or domains uh, where we can pile on and open up a window to exploit against them. Well, there are some challenges that go with that. Uh, as you add cyber and space uh, to the traditional domains of air, sea, and land. Um, and uh, you could argue that there's a sixth domain uh, that's affected by all of this, and it's the cognitive domain. Uh, as we uh, add more and more capability um, to the battlefield, uh, the human brain has not kept up uh, with the advances in technology. Uh, so now we're operating in, in battle at uh, hypersonic speeds, faster than Mach 5, speed of light when it comes to uh, uh, directed energy weapons and, uh, and sensors, of course, and electronic warfare, and computer clock speeds approaching 9 gigahertz. So, uh, you know, this is not something that the human brain is uh, really uh, well uh, disposed to handle. And the way we can distribute the workload, so to speak, is by echeloning, uh, you know, with the brigade focused on the close fight, the division on uh, supporting that close fight, but really focused on the next fight. And the core is more focused on the fight after next, supporting the next fight and shaping the fight after next. So you're distributing uh, the cognitive workload uh, temporally uh, if, and, and spatially too, because one of the characteristics of multi-domain battle is that it expands the battle space and Jack alluded to that. Um, you have really from home station, you know, from fort to port and then from the port of entry all the way to the flot and from the flot all the way into the enemy's homeland potentially. So who's going to manage all of that battle space? And so the best way to do that, of course, is by echeloning responsibilities. Um, you do have weapons at all echelons that can, and sensors that can see into and shoot into uh, others' uh, uh, battle space. Well, who's going to deconflict all of that? So you need higher headquarters to do that. Um, if you have a brigade that's taking fire or a division that's taking fire from another division's battle space, um, you know, who's going to figure out who's going to counter that fire? Uh, 
you know, are the divisions going to sort that out between themselves, or is there a higher headquarters that's going to allocate resources and handle that for them? Uh, so, you know, these are uh, a couple of aspects. And then the third is limited resources. Uh, you know, cyber domain or cyber warfare assets and space-based assets are not cheap. Um, and uh, even, the, you know, CubeSats and small satellites like that are, are, are not um, really at the level of a commodity uh, like ammunition. So somebody has to manage all of that. And then lastly, there's the whole aspect of being a link between uh, the fight and the sustainment effort, uh, which Accor is well organized to handle uh, working with the theater army who's managing the lines of communications and protecting them and uh, resourcing the battle with the actual fighting itself. Somebody has to be that interface. So the Corps uh, would have all of those responsibilities in the multi-domain battle. Um, so then there's the, the next question is, you know, how does the Corps organize to do all of this? Well, there's a couple kind of cores, really. Uh, there's the uh, Corps as a headquarters. Um, you know, you may say that's uh, sort of a hollow uh, core, uh, so to speak, but uh, that probably doesn't do it justice. And then there's a core as a formation that's fully enabled and has all of its supporting warfighting functions organic to it. So the Corps as a headquarters has utility in the, uh, in a contact situation, pre-hostility or the competition uh, uh, phase of a, uh, where they're working with host nations, they are conducting exercises and, and uh, learning uh, about the interoperability challenges of uh, various uh, nations. That's not without merit. Um, if you, if you move from the contact to a blunt situation, they can, in the early stages of blunt for, blunting operation, uh, manage some forces um, uh, for a period of time. As you move into the surge uh, phase of an operation where you're trying to uh, really achieve uh, a decisive outcome, uh, they can assist with uh, the reception staging and onward movement of additional forces moving into the theater. So they're not without value, but you do need the other kind of uh, core to actually do the fighting, and that's the formation core, uh, the core that is uh, a full up round, so to speak. And it has uh, multiple divisions under it that it's trained with, and, uh, and also, most critically, uh, a full staff that's trained together through multiple exercises and uh, with the supporting brigades and other enablers that really round out that core's capabilities. A core headquarters by itself can't do it all. It needs a lot of different types of separate brigades as, as we call them, uh, signals, medical, uh, chemical, uh, aviation, and, uh, and so forth. But it also needs um, a uh, fires headquarters and a sustainment headquarters that really rise to a general officer level as well. Um, this is a big complex organization. They all need to learn how to operate together. And then the divisions can sort of come and go, whether they be light or heavy. But I will tell you that even at the core level, there is a certain um, level of uh, specificity. We have our 18th Airborne Corps. Yes, they have a heavy division in that uh, core and they can manage a heavy division, but that's really not their specialty. Their specialty is more forced entry. Uh, then you have, we have the Third Armored Corps that is more aligned in the U.S. Army uh, with uh, mechanized uh, forces and is used to figuring out the sustainment challenges with uh, that goes with that. And then you know we have our other uh, corps, the First Corps out in the uh, Pacific, and then uh, now we're standing up the Fifth U.S. Corps in, in Europe. And that core is going to be able to soak in the environment of Europe during the contact phase, during the competition, um, and learn about the forces that are available and work through interoperability challenges, which are vital to uh, fighting. And I learned in Operation Inherent Resolve that uh, that's probably the biggest challenge, is trying to figure out how to get uh, all of the coalition forces, some of which may or you know, we're not NATO allies, 
But even within the NATO allies, you know, you have the five eyes and non five eyes communities. You have to work through all of that. And the best time to do that is before the onset of hostilities, not um, while they're occurring. Uh, and learning to operate together as a team and knowing how the core fights. Every core has a personality and a way to fight. And uh, they develop this over time. And to an extent, it's driven by the personality of a commander. But uh, a culture takes hold after a while, and they have an idea of how they're going to fight, and uh, and this is developed through a series of exercises, and that way th this core becomes a team of teams and is going to be very effective, because if you're thinking about fighting the Russians, well, they don't have multiple languages, multiple doctrines, they do have uh, different generations of equipment, but to a large extent, those generations are compatible, use the same type of ammunition. So we have to work through all that. We have to figure out as a core how we're going to fight fires with fires. The force field artillery headquarters may evolve into a multi-domain fires headquarters uh, with a, a general officer in charge. And then the sustainment issues, you know, the, the medevac and Kazovac and, and logistics of all of this with multiple different types of forces, that all has to be sorted out. And it has to be sorted out with host nations or likely host nations that have uh, the infrastructure that's gonna to have to support all of that. And you have to understand that where the, the limitations and capabilities of that infrastructure as well. Um, that only happens with the standing core that is uh, exercising on that ground with all of its enablers. So uh, the core as a formation with all of its enablers uh, and preferably with some permanently assigned divisions, but uh, maybe that's less important but certainly divisions that have exercised with the core at some point uh, is going to be what allows you to deal or prevent the potential fait accompli. Uh, a full up formation core uh, is going to be much more effective in preventing a fait accompli, uh, which is really the preferred outcome. And that's how you get into the uh, um, uh, area denial uh, situation, which can be very challenging to overcome. So I'll stop there and, and pass it back to, to Jack. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, so in terms of what that means for NATO, I think there's two quick things I would highlight. The first is that if we look at the Houthis in Yemen or uh, Iran and its proxies uh, in not only in Iran, but also in Iraq, Syria and Lebanon, um, these are, in many cases, non-state actors who now have long-range precision fires, uh, ranging from loitering munitions to ballistic missiles that are actually pretty accurate. They're getting guided. Um, and so, in some ways, the, the purely unencumbered core is actually uh, not, it is critical to a lot of expeditionary activity, but it still needs a lot of the wrap that, um, you would need if you were in a, if you were a full formation, because a lot of the force protection requirements for just sustaining yourself in theater, even if you're going in in a rapid reaction context, you still need some of those sensors and capabilities just to protect the headquarters and its infrastructure. Um, and so I think that is a shift that we've seen. And that, that I say that because it's quite important for looking at the suitability of the current cause that we have in NATO. There are currently 10 in NATO, um, including, well, not including uh, the US Five Corps, which is being stood up and will have its command post in Europe. Um, but of those 10, most of them were developed or transitioned from Cold War formations into the rea rapid reaction model. The idea that you have a deployable headquarters, which will uh, essentially function to take troops under command when NATO agrees that there is a mission um, and therefore it becomes the, the hub for a spoke system of a coalition of the willing. Um, that is becoming less suitable for precisely the reasons that Sean just indicated. If you're gonna get stuck into the competition space, you need to soak in the environment, you need to understand the ground, the politics, have the relationships and have some of those force protection measures in place so that you can actually sustain your units if it suddenly transitions to a contact situation. And that means that you need to be long prepared. In the same time, um, if you are going to stand up and do warfighting, 
it is going to become increasingly difficult to just take units under command and bolt them together. Um, that is firstly because a lot of the multi-domain capabilities like cyber or uh, el electronic warfare capabilities are not ones that comply with NATO STANAGs. They are sovereign capabilities that members will bring to the table, but they'll have all sorts of protections around disclosing that those capabilities. Um, but even if we think about content conventional capabilities like artillery, um, a good example would be, you know, the US has much more firepower to bring to the table than a lot of other NATO members. But if the US plugs into one of those NATO core, US doctrine would respond to quite a lot of wartime situations with cluster munitions, which plenty of other members of the Alliance have uh, signed a treaty obliging them not to use. And so if a US formation is under the command or part of that core, NATO core, can it use its ammunition or not? Um, now, there are ways around that. Um, and, you know, legally, you can work out a good process and deconflict those issues and make sure that no one's breaking the law. But that all takes time and it's all complicated. It can't be done in the heat of battle. And so you need those formations to train together. And I think one of the things that we need to look at very carefully, and I would highlight that some of this work is being done in NATO as we speak through the deterrence strategy and other initiatives that are ongoing, not all of which are public, but it, a shift from rapid reaction to long preparation. And in addition to that, uh, a more focused way of exercising so that you do have that cohesive team of teams. Um, if we look at, say, just, just to pick three of the 10 core, and I'm not singling them out, I'm just using them as an example. Um, if we take Euro core, the uh, German Netherlands core, and the um, uh, French rapid reaction core, what you have there is you have three core headquarters able to perform core level command, but they do not have the organic enablers and capabilities that the core would need to actually fight. None of them do. Um, each of those countries collect, well, those countries collectively could probably populate one of those core headquarters with the enablers. But because you have three of them, if they are supposed to exercise with units, you're dividing the effort between three countries that in a crisis could only actually form one formation, but they are trying to train with three teams of teams. And that, that doesn't work, right? That you're gonna dilute your exercises, you're going to um, not have that cohesion and readiness that you need. And so um, across NATO, there needs to be a transition to making these core either much more dedicated uh, competitive organizations, and we're seeing that with um, MNC Northeast, where there is a, uh, they're bringing together all of the early forward presence battle groups and the units uh, in the nation states, member states that are bordering Russia under one command so that you can have uh, coherence in deterrence activity, um, or it needs to be a much more cohesive war fighting formation. And a good example where that is starting is in the arc. Uh, where it has just stood up as a warfighting headquarters at readiness um, and has been doing extensive exercises to certify itself to be able to perform that function with some of those enablers. Um, but making sure that those enablers are available to exercise is a really critical challenge if those core are going to perform their functions. Now, there might be um, a valid argument for having rapid reaction headquarters to go out and do you know, complex humanitarian work or other issues. Um, but frankly, a lot of those things are going to be either done by um, sort of task forces, um, in which case a core headquarters probably isn't the correct formation, um, or actually the US, because the US brings most of the enablers and capabilities that the Alliance lacks, is very likely to use one of its own core to do that, as happened with Operation Inherent Resolve. Um, and so I think as we get into great power competition and the efficiency of our formations becomes critical, we need to really start thinking about which of these headquarters can actually do the job that is needed at that echelon. Is it resourced appropriately? And perhaps more importantly, when it comes to members, because NATO cannot ask members to deliver troops, uh, members offer formations to NATO and it can accept them or say we don't need that, but it can't make specific requests. What we have therefore is quite a lot of duplication of effort where things are being offered by different members that don't actually become greater than the sum of their parts when they're put together. Um, and so we need to have a much more rationalized core echelon where members are rewarded for offering some of the um, 
less high profile and perhaps less sexy kind of uh, capabilities that are necessary to make that formation a sustainable, viable formation that can perform that war fighting function and that has the long term relationships and expertise in its tasks to provide the deterrence and competition function um, to make sure that we don't then have to apply the war fighting function. Um, and with that, I would hand back over to Peter uh, and submit us to Q&A. Thanks, uh, Jack. I, I, I've got to say, I think you did a, a great job at the end there uh, in summing up some of what you said uh, in the paper about the NATO cause, various, and the explanations for why they exist. And I think you know, there are complex reasons why each of those core exists. But, you know, I, I would uh, I would say to you know, the, the people uh, watching and listening that, you know, get into that final chapter to understand the challenge that's got to be that NATO has got to take up in in rationalizing uh, some of these structures. But in also understanding of how you get to something more useful to sit underneath it. Um, and I think that's one of the key points. Now, I wanted to get to one piece in your paper, which I'm a bit frustrated you didn't bring up, Jack, because you talk in there very briefly about the comparison with the Russian experiences here. And Justin Bronx's question talks to this, you know, the Russian experience at the core level, which doesn't exist I I exactly that, but, but I think is a really useful uh, illustration of how others, competitors are looking at this problem. Could you touch on that for me? Sure, so uh, the Russians, um, had a set of reforms in the 2000s where they thought, right, we don't need these massive unwieldy formations. Uh, we're going to have agile, highly enabled brigades, and they're going to form these battalion tactical groups, which will um, operate with a huge amount of organic enablement. Um, and they tried this. They, they tried it in Ukraine um, and they found that it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is that these formations would go in start trying to perform their functions and then would run out of sustainment capability. Um, and they weren't plugged into some of the higher level um, effects that they needed to be able to punch through and, and deliver their objectives. Um, and so the Russians have actually backpedaled on that quite substantially. They have reestablished a whole series of their divisions um, and they have started conducting snap exercises across their military districts, which actually allow the military district command to mobilize uh, the, they, the, they call it the army headquarters, which is kind of the equivalent of the core, but it then exercises with its subordinate divisions, integrates all of those strategic anti-air capabilities, aviation, air assault, um, the air force joins in as well, usually artillery, fires, reconnaissance, etc. And they do a really, really impressive job of, of moving that material around Russia um, assembling it in a point and conducting complex exercises, which, you know, one of the challenges that NATO has is um, because we don't have quite so much open space, you know, we will break up our exercises so that the engineers will go to one place and practice crossing a river. The artillery will go to a range somewhere else and practice doing that. And what the Russians have been very effective at is combining that to do integrated exercising of, say, river crossing. Um, and I think river crossing is one of those multi-domain challenges because, you know, keeping a wide weight gap crossing available while you're under persistent space-based observation and there are long range precision fires is a huge nightmare, which requires all of these specialisms to be at play. Um, and if we don't exercise for that, because of the number of capabilities required to pull it off in time, then we will not be competitive. Whereas the Russians have, they still have enabled brigades for discrete tasks like peacekeeping in the Gorno Karabakh or some of their operations in Syria. But fundamentally for war fighting, they have switched back to that large formation because they know that it works. So, I mean, that, that leads me really to perhaps what Sean's experience was in, in three core. I mean, how much of these you know, individual elements, these additional assets, you know, cyber engineering, artillery, aviation logs, et cetera, does, does the core level need to own full time? And how much, you know, this is Edward Flint's question, how much does it need to broker off others? Sean, you know, what worked for you in three core? If you didn't own them, was it always a problem in, in additional integration? Yeah, Peter. Uh, so we were, uh, when I was commanding third core, sort of uh, moving back toward 
our ability to recombine these assets uh, and to uh, fight uh, together instead of considering them all as modular elements that could work for any core headquarters. So yeah, instead of the, the core military intelligence brigade going off and working for somebody else, you know, the realization that, that at the division and the core level, both, um, that their organic brigades, separate brigades, whether fires or logistics or um, aviation need to consider themselves as part of a unified team. Um, and as we began to recombine those and uh, conduct uh, both uh, live and virtual exercises uh, and constructive, we began to uh, really identify some of the gaps that had opened up over time uh, during our counterinsurgency experience where we were looking at ourselves as uh, more static operating out of uh, uh, bases. And we'd used a lot of those formations as bill payers uh, to uh, enable the brigades to fight independently. Well, um, you know, uh, there's a limit to how much you can salami slice out to everybody and give everybody a little of their own <laughs> that, by the way, creates problems when you're trying to mass effects in a specific area, because then you have to go gather them back up again. But um, there's also, you know, you start to run out uh, at some point. So um, the, the United States Army is moving back towards a more division-centric army uh, and beginning now to talk more and more about reassembling those core enablers as well. Um, the wet gap crossing capability didn't go away. Uh, and it, but uh, it certainly needs to be, uh, you know, uh, invested in uh, some more to respond to, you know, the, the, the newer threats that are coming out there. You know, a hypersonic weapon comes screaming in, you know, at Mach 6. You know, how are you going to shoot that down? How are you going to defend it against that? Uh, or, you know, the other thing is we have to be more resilient. Um, you know, we have to be able to reconstitute combat forces. This is something that NATO used to practice quite a bit uh, back in the day. You know, you, you, when you're fighting against a peer competitor, you're going to take some pretty heavy hits. You're going, units are going to be pushed down towards combat ineffectiveness. Well, you, you know, you have two options. You can reconstitute that unit or you can replace it. It's a lot faster uh, and easier to reconstitute a unit in many cases than to simply replace it. Uh, and even if you do replace it, you know, sooner or later you're going to run out of replacements and then the replacements for the replacements could be the reconstituted units. So we used to practice something called weapon systems replacement operations, WISRO, um, and you had spare equipment. Well, you know, during counterinsurgency, people would look at that and say, well, that's waste. Why would you have all that extra equipment just sitting around? Um, well, it's, you know, redundancy is not necessarily a vice and sometimes in some cases it's a virtue in combat. So, um, you know, rebuilding those types of stocks and exercising those functions has been uh, really an increasing area of focus. And, and really our doctrine has lagged. You know, we have to kind of go back and rediscover how to conduct these large scale um, operations at the division and core level. And then how do they work together? You know, what, in my experience as a core commander, that dividing line between the division of core has blurred over time and counterinsurgency. And, and then some of the tactics that we use in counterinsurgency, you know, where if you take a casualty, the mission becomes medevac, right? Well, that's not the case in large scale combat operations. You're not gonna fly a, heli a medevac helicopter to the point of injury in the middle of an obstacle breach, right? Uh, you know, you, you're just going to have to say, well, you know, try to get that casualty to the nearest armored uh, ambulance and take it to uh, 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 an LZ in a, in a safe location. And then maybe we can put them on a helicopter, but maybe not. Uh, maybe it's just that forward aid station is the best that we can offer. And coming to terms with those types of things where, you know, in Afghanistan, when I was the DCOS ops there, it was all about medevac rings. Well, you know, your, your limited advance was limited by your medevac ring. That's not going to be the case in large scale combat operations. And we have to understand the difference and, un, and to an extent unlearn some of those lessons. 
um, the, the next question, there are a whole series of questions now that, that sort of link to uh, multi-domain operations, MDO, or joint all-domain operations, JDO, or the next thing that comes up, or in you know, British eyes, multi-domain integration or integrated operating model. I mean, there seem to be two facets here. Um, you know, where does MDO work best seems to be, you know, one of those key things. I mean, for those that aren't aware in the audience, you know, MDO is, is the idea that you can throw absolutely anything in the arsenal at a particular problem. So someone has to integrate all those uh, facets together, ensure the airspace is clear, get the cruise missile from the submarine into the right place at the right time to deal with the threat. And, and lots of these questions relate to where is the best situation in the land that makes that happen? Is it the core? Is it the division? Is it something even further down the chain, closer to the fight? And linked to that is what the heck does the core link to and integrate with in the other environments? I mean, you know, is it is it fleet commands? Uh, is it carrier groups? Is it, you know, uh, expeditionary air wings? Is it the JFAC? You know, how the language doesn't cross the, the boundaries. And so this this idea of integration and multi-domain operations comes a bit unstuck as as we start to re-understand where the core sits within the land environment and, and response from both, please. Jack, do you want to start off? Sure. Um, so I, I think um, at the moment, a lot of that integration in a high-end warfighting context of multiple domains would happen at the JFC, the Joint Forces Command level. Um, but that's quite problematic. And it's problematic for, for a number of regions, but essentially the, the, the biggest one is the length of the kill chain involved. Um, if, uh, to take an example, if an F-35 picks up a uh, TLAR as it's flying back from a sortie, because it has an impressive sensor array on it and it's stealthy and can get into an environment where it might see that, um, and it passes it to the JFC, which is several hundred kilometers away, and that passes that to, you know, that then communicates with the Navy and asks for a TLAM to be fired at it. Um, that's gonna take half an hour to get there, that will show up on Russian radar and the vehicle that it's trying to target can move um, in six minutes. So that's just not gonna work. You need, uh, the F-35 might not want to open its bays and reveal its location um, because then it loses its stealth profile. So it doesn't want to engage. So who does it pass it to? Um, and it's not gonna be able to pass it to the battle group or brigade headquarters that's in the close fight because the uh, stealth compatible command links and, and uh, data links to the F-35 are very, very vulnerable. And you don't want to put those down links in headquarters that could very plausibly be overrun by the enemy. Um, and so I think the core fire control headquarters is simultaneously in direct contact with divisional fires um, and therefore has short latency uh, fires that it can bring onto that target. Um, but at the same time, is far enough from the flop that it can probably receive that data. Um, and similarly, if we think about cyber capabilities, and I appreciate that there are some people in the audience who know a lot more about this than me, um, but realistically, cyber capabilities are national kind of field army echelon capabilities or higher um, in terms of where they're going to be developed. But if you're going to actually have an effect with those, firstly, uh, for it to be fast, you probably need physical penetration of the system you're trying to target in a lot of cases, which means you need to task a tactical unit to do it. Um, and simultaneously, you will need um, an understanding of the operating environment because in a war fighting scenario, the electromagnetic spectrum is not going to look the same as the baseline that it was before the conflict. Civilian pass, you know, traffic will change dramatically and so forth. So to understand the returns you're getting from those standoff capabilities, you actually need people on the ground. And again, because of the classification of lots of those issues um, and the fact that they are not NATO STANAG kind of, you know, compatible because they're very much sovereign capabilities that are kept at high classification. A core headquarters is probably where you can have those people plug in and, it, you know, say what's available to the commander. And at the same time, still have a touch point, have a feel for the tactical fight enough to understand where those capabilities can be useful and where they can be synchronized. I think if you start putting control of those capabilities at higher echelons than core, you get too far from the tactical fight. But I defer to Sean on that. Yeah, I mean, sure, you know, this is, you know, part of this idea about integration 
and, and at what level you do integrate, you've experienced, right? I mean, in OIR, you know, you, you, it wasn't necessarily the joint fight that you were doing, but it was with agencies as well as the coalition. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, right. There's the, the real answer on this is it's distributed uh, at, at, at various echelons, uh, just as fires are distributed at various echelons. I mean, this is not really a, a revolutionary concept. It's more of an evolutionary concept. Uh, we, you know, we've figured out how to give 60 millimeter mortars at the company level and, you know, 81 and, and 107s at the, or 120s at the battalion and, you know, 155 at brigades and, and on up, right? You know, so if we can do it with fires, we can do it um, with uh, other types of capabilities too. But there's a limit to how far down you're passing it. You know, a platoon is not going to do very much in the way of electronic warfare. Uh, unless it's an EW platoon. But I mean, an infantry platoon is not going to do very much in, in that regard. It may have to defend itself or understand how to operate in an EW uh, environment, but it's not going to uh, point an electronic warfare system at the enemy or a cyber, you know, the, or a cyber system. They're not going to squeeze a trigger and have a cyber effect. You know, that's not how that works. Um, and then there's a limit to the number of people that are actually able to advise commanders on this, you know, so uh, with the right security clearances and so forth. So you can't distribute them all the way down to uh, low tactical echelons. They're going to be held at a higher tact at a higher echelon. So, you know, there's going to be some of this at the division level, there's no doubt. But at the core level, uh, you know, you can really get uh, a little bit more, I think, of a uh, uh, center of uh, or a uh, uh, critical mass of these kinds of capabilities with host nations, with interagency, with, uh, you know, the, the multiple domains. And at the core level, you have a lot of people with a lot of joint experience at that point. They, the staff is more senior, so they've served uh, in, uh, with uh, maritime or air headquarters, and they, they know how to operate with them a little bit better than they do at lower echelons. And again, you know, really the division can do a lot of what the core does, but the division is going to be so invested in that close fight, then it just becomes a, a, a cognitive challenge for that division staff, which is a bit junior. And I've commanded at both levels. And I, I'm, I'm very proud of my division uh, command and my team that I had there. But, you know, where on the division staff, you have majors and lieutenant colonels, you have full colonels on a core staff. Well, what's the difference between a lieutenant colonel and a colonel? That's a pretty big, uh, heavy cut in quality, really. You know, uh, a lot of those lieutenant colonels go on to become colonels, but they haven't had that experience yet, um, and they haven't threaded the needle on selection. So it's a different quality and experience level at the core level who can synthesize all of these uh, very complex considerations and, uh, and, and meld them in such a way that it complements the campaign. You know, you can have a very successful division fight that may have absolutely no um, effect or may even have a negative effect on the overall concept of the campaign, you know? Uh, so, you know, these, these are some of the things that have to be balanced out. And the core just provides you another opportunity, uh, another echelon that can do that, that's just one more step removed from the fight that can take a breath and think about how to integrate cyber and, and whatnot into, uh, you know, the upcoming. And, and Sean, I get that. But where we're talking about multi-domain integration, we're talking about, you know, there is only, you know, in, in the maritime component, there'll, there'll be a, you know, a maritime component commander. Uh, and he's going to send his liaison staff somewhere. Now, yeah. you know, historically, he's, you know, in the last 20 years, he might have sent a couple of liaison officers to, to the division. Uh, he might send it to CJTF. You know, how does he start to understand where to stick that liaison cell? You know, it, does he dock in with core? Does he dock in with div? Does he, does he leave it further up? Is there a LCC that sits on top? How does that integration yeah. actually work when we've had, right. you know, a, a bleeding of, of the numbers? It, it just doesn't relate to the other commands to me. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, on, on the air component side, the Air Force has a, uh, an entire force structure dedicated to supporting all the way down the chain. Right. But 
on the maritime side or now space side or and even cyber, we don't have that. Um, you know, there's a limited number of people that they can send out. I mean, where, where do you get a maritime, you know, a, a Navy or a Marine Corps liaison officer? They're, they're, they're relatively small services. They don't have a force structure dedicated to going out. The Marines do to a certain extent, it's called the Anglico, the uh, Air Naval Gunfire Liaison Company. The Navy doesn't really have anything like that. Uh, so, you know, where do you put those teams? Well, you know, they're most likely you're gonna be able to get them all together in one place. Um, and if you have five divisions in the field, it's gonna be really hard to resource five of those. But if there's only one core headquarters overseeing five divisions, you can get them all together in one place uh, and still get the effect of that synergy. And as Jack said earlier, they're a little bit farther uh, from the fray and uh, more survivable if you consolidate them there. On the interagency side, uh, I will tell you, you know, the, our three letter agencies and intel agencies, people like that, it can be very hard to get enough of them, um, you know, on site uh, and, uh, and pull together for that intelligence fusion. And I'll say one other thing for our host nations, some of which are rather small uh, and are, are contributing nations, they can't, uh, you know, peanut butter spread their resources around to everybody either. You know, they're going to have to pick and choose where they're going to invest their limited resources. So having a, a smaller number of senior headquarters uh, that are uh, involved in uh, the fight, you know, seems to, uh, seems to provide them with a better locus for their limited resources to invest. Okay, so uh, aware that time's coming around, and try and thread together uh, questions from uh, two of our uh, wonderful audience, Mike Maiden and Madeline Moon, who's probably uh, back from her beach walk. Um, part of this, you know, Madeline puts forward is about, you know, how do you see the potentially depleted NATO forces post COVID to be able to dedicate personnel to what sounds like a high degree of commitment in time wise to operational and skills training to develop this effective core. And that's linked to Mike Maiden's question, which is, you know, in reality, what is the level, form and frequency of exercises that you really need to test the, for, the, the core formation effectively? Jack, do you want to start on that? Sure. Um, Go ahead, Jack. So I, I think in terms of the COVID question, um, the military should not be the first port of call to deal with a pandemic. I appreciate that in Europe, the military has provided a crisis response capability, um, but that is because civilian organizations have been overwhelmed or because their mass has been fixed and the military has a unique capacity to move people around. Um, what I would say is that hasn't particularly drawn on those operational headquarters. Um, it's mainly drawn on higher staff functions within Army HQ um, and the kind of, it's drawn heavily on certain trades. So logs, engineers and the medical corps in particular. Um, but it, the reality is the military is for deterrence and war fighting and that's what we should be paying them to do. And we should make sure that they are equipped, trained and exercised to be able to do that effectively. Um, pulling them into contingency operations is a valuable function that the military can perform, but I don't think that that should be driving force structure. Um, and as a, as a kind of simple reason for that, the military can't often solve these problems. Um, if we think about COVID in the UK, there are off the top of my head, so don't quote me on the numbers exactly, but there's about 14,000 logisticians in the army and about 8,000 medical personnel, I think across the services. Many of those medical personnel are already committed to the NHS. Um, and you, know, you do the math on needing to do 60 million vaccinations. Um, that is not enough people to run that. So they okay. provide a limited surge function, but actually um, it, it, you need civilians to backfill that role. Um, and I, I think we have to, I think we shouldn't trick ourselves into thinking that the military can dig us out of that hole. Okay, in which case, if that's the answer, Sean, what does an exercise program to develop a fully fledged warfighting core look like? How stressful is that? 
Right. So uh, in the United States, um, we try to have uh, each uh, division and core headquarters go through a, uh, uh, a major exercise um, on average uh, every other year. Um, and that actually brigades to go to uh, the National Training Center or its uh, equivalent um, every other year as well. And in between uh, in those off years, they're usually deployed, <laughs> which is why they don't do it every year. Um, so you need uh, that sort of frequency because you have that level of turnover in your staff and your commanders uh, to ensure that they all understand, they're all working from the same playbook uh, or singing from the same hymn or whatever. Uh, they need to uh, have that frequency of exercise. And of course, in between those, you have uh, smaller level exercises where they're playing the higher headquarters for their subordinate units or, um, or supporting their uh, sister uh, units uh, as uh, as flanking units. So there are multiple other opportunities and exercises. It's almost a continuous process um, to achieve the level of flexibility that you need to fight in this kind of environment. Um, and I would second uh, what Jack said that uh, you have to keep in mind what uh, organizations are for and not just focus on what they can do. Um, armies can do a lot of things. They can feed a lot of people. They can haul a lot of stuff around on highways. They can fly things around in the air. You know, they can, they have a lot of hospitals, but that's not what they're for. They're for war fighting. And if they're not good at war fighting, who else is going to do that for you? Right. I mean, um, the, you know, the military can step into other people's roles, but nobody can step into the military's role. Uh, so you, you really need to uh, allow them to focus. Um, and uh, that's challenging enough as it is. I mean, just all the things that go into that. And, and Jack made reference to encumbered and unencumbered units. In peacetime, those, those cores uh, are, the term encumbering seems to have a co negative connotation because you're thinking, well, it's more of a burden for the core staff to have to focus on training the divisions and ensuring the readiness of its subordinate divisions. But when it's time to go to war, now you have a level of mutual understanding between uh, echelons. And uh, you know the, the, the really essential component to an effective combat unit, whether it's a Roman legion or a, or a modern core, is trust. And you have to build those bonds of trust. And, it's, and, the, and a good way to do that is through a robust uh, exercise program and uh, also day-to-day -day interaction where uh, one headquarters is obligated to support another, uh, you, you start to trust one another. And then when the bullets start to fly, um, you know, that trust will be there as it should be. Uh, Sean, Jack, thank you very much indeed. We've got to pull stumps there and I apologise to our delegates for not answering or not getting to all their questions, particularly a great one from Adam Coffey on the Western fixation of the core and uh, Mark Proctor, a, a really nice one on the uh, sixth uh, domain, this um, uh, idea that you introduced Sean at the start. So um, thank you very much to both our speakers, the event organisers uh, and the team at RUSI and AUSA, but mostly uh, of course to listeners, delegates and attendees. You will can hear more from RUSI on the core level over the next year and go back to uh, recent papers and events that we've done on this, including the one uh, with ARC uh, in the autumn last year. There's more that you can find in Military Matters online at rusi.org forward slash milsai. And finally, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind you that RUSI is a membership organisation and a charity. We receive no core funding from the UK government. We can't make a profit. So you know that every penny of your membership is spent on improving the level of debate on defence and security uh, here at our headquarters. Now, if you consider yourself connected to the profession of arms, uh, you might think about becoming a member. Let's face it right now, you haven't got much else to spend your dime on in lockdown. So please think about it. And details can be found at rusi.org forward slash membership. If you need an independent view on that, Rusi recently won the Prospect Magazine Think Tank of the Year recommendations to come to us for uh, your, all your advice. Don't come better than that. Thanks very much for joining us.